spoke on Friday, but um, for those of you that weren't there for that, um, my name is Deborah Pat. I'm a medical oncologist. Um, I'm a breast medical oncologist. I practice here in Austin, uh, where I serve as a vice president of Texas Oncology. We uh, are a large practice in the state that sees about half of Texans with cancer. Um, we have several folks that are just isolated subspecialists in our group, so I'm one of those. Um, I just see breast cancer and drive our research at the local level for, um, for breast cancer. So I'm going to talk to you about symptom management. Um, and uh, there is actually some new information around symptom management, which is great. Um, but it largely um, uh, is a challenge for all survivors. You know, breast cancer is kind of in a unique scenario that whether or not you're cured of your cancer, or believe that you're likely to be cured of your cancer, about 85% of patients are on chronic treatment because 85% of breast cancers are positive for estrogen. Um, and so even uh, there, there's sort of a cohort of patients that have side effects of surgery and chemotherapy, but also a cohort of patients that chronically have intervention with endocrine therapy, um, and those side effects can be variable. Hello, good morning. Um, it amazes me because sometimes people take um, endocrine therapy and they have no side effects. Truly, there are those patients that take aromatase inhibitors or tamoxifen and they you know, feel as if they can't tell a difference from their normal life. But in many patients, um, endocrine-based side effects influence their, um, their life in so many ways. So the side effects that I'm gonna sort of talk about, but um, feel welcome to ask questions as we go through. We're a small group, so please feel welcome to interrupt me with that. Um, are things like uh, weight gain, which can be an endocrine side effect and can be a side effect after chemotherapy, depression, hot flashes and night sweats, cognitive dysfunction, which is particularly challenging, secondary malignancies like endometrial cancer, which occurs at a low incidence after um, tamoxifen use, um, osteoporosis and bone fracture, because when you completely inhibit the production of estrogen with aromatase inhibitors, diminishing bone strength is one of the natural consequences. Arthralgias and joint symptoms, which are common after aromatase inhibitors. Reduced productivity, which can be a consequence of anything that taxes you, be it surgery or chemotherapy and endocrine therapy. Chronic fatigue, um, and then late cardiovascular effects, so which can occur with a result of being treated with an anthracycline or being treated chronically with the HER2 blocking agents. So hot flashes, <laughs> any of us are familiar with this. If only we knew to anticipate it better, um, but uh, for most patients, they come on suddenly, you know, usually in the least opportune time, uh, make you red and sweaty um, in ways that are um, sometimes um, socially or professionally compromising, um, and are hard to manage um, because of sort of their, um, their um, intermittent nature. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to just bring up is that for some patients, it may be appropriate to think about less treatment. Um, uh, hot flashes can be caused from a number of reasons. Um, one of those being um, uh, if you're premenopausal, suppression of your ovarian function, which occurs during chemotherapy. Um, and so uh, if that's the case, it could be temporary, but predominantly patients with breast cancer have hot flashes because of the estrogen blockade that they take chronically. Being tamoxifen, that's a selective estrogen receptor modulator, Phaslodex, which is a selective estrogen mo modulator, also called fulvestrant, um, or um, aromatase inhibitors like um, aromasin or um, Fomara or Arimidex. Um, and so those are the common causes of hot flashes. Um, but for patients that um, don't have invasive breast cancer and that are taking those drugs for chemo prevention because they have a DCIS or an intraepithelial neoplasm, neopla neoplasm, you can actually use less treatment and that's probably just as effective. So I thought I'd talk to you about that because um, less endocrine therapy will cause less hot flashes. Um, so at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium this year, there was um, a study, a prevention study presented called TAM-01, and it was a randomized trial of low-dose tamoxifen to prevent the recurrence of intraepithelial neoplasia in the breast. Um, so it took patients that were 75 uh, years of age or younger that had hormone-sensitive intraepithelial neoplasia, so your ADH, 
LCIS, DCIS that's estrogen positive, okay? So not invasive breast cancer, but pre-invasive breast cancer or high-risk lesions. The things that you would consider um, chemo prevention being a reasonable strategy. Um, and uh, randomized patients on one-to-one -to, -one, um, uh, to tamoxifen uh, five milligrams PO daily um, versus placebo. Because in this group, most patients don't die of breast cancer, but we know, especially among DCIS, that the incidence of developing an, an invasive cancer after five years um, is about 4% with appropriate local therapy, um, that there, there's some benefit in, uh, in chemo prevention is that 4% could go down to 2% if you have appropriate endocrine chemo prevention. So what if we gave less? So if you recall, the normal dose of tamoxifen that we use in chemo prevention is 20 milligrams. So this study looked at five milligrams, so 25% of the dose. And what they found is that there was a substantial reduction in risk uh, in comparison to placebo with the low-dose tamoxifen. And so that's the um, uh, five milligrams of tamoxifen, um, that it was a substantial risk reduction. And as you look at this, while this is not a comparator of what it looks like to do no treatment versus five milligrams of tamoxifen versus 20 milligrams of tamoxifen, what I can tell you is that historically we know that tamoxifen at 20 milligrams a day in chemo prevention um, uh, reduces the risk by about half. And what this shows us is that tamoxifen at five milligrams a day reduces the risk by about half. Um, so what we can say, see is that um, there's tremendous benefit even from a lower dose of endocrine therapy. Um, so in that, I'll, I'll just say that for patients that don't have invasive breast cancer but that have pre-invasive breast cancer, less endocrine therapy may be a reasonable option. And with that being considered, even patients that have an invasive breast cancer, it's a reasonable discussion to have with your doctor if your symptoms, whatever they are, that are endocrine-based are wicked, um, you know, is there an opportunity to, um, to lower my dose of treatment? Might that be a reasonable middle step if my other step would be just discontinuation? And I think that that's a reasonable discussion. Aside from reducing endocrine therapy, um, uh, one thing that can help with, that's new with, um, with hot flashes is a drug called oxybutynin, and this was also presented at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. Oxybutynin is historically a drug used and FDA approved to treat bladder spasm, um, but there was a study that looked at um, how it would be useful to try to treat hot flashes um, among uh, patients with breast cancer. And, you know, just so you all are aware, historically in this space to mitigate hot flashes in patients that have endocrine blockade, we tend to recommend things like exercise, things like magnesium supplementation, and other drugs approved for un other indications like Pristique or Effexor um, that are drugs in the class of um, uh, antidepressants that also have side effects of diminishing hot flashes. Um, so this is a new treatment that is also leveraging a currently existing drug because it can decrease hot flashes. So looking at oxybutynin um, at 2.5 milligrams twice daily or five milligrams twice daily. And I'll say that as we look at oxybutynin actually, we use a once daily dose because we have an extended release available in the United States. So just as we think about this, it's not entirely um, uh, extrapolatable to the United States, but um, oxybutynin was what they studied. So placebo, 2.5 milligrams and five milligrams. And what you could see is that um, the hot flash score was substantially reduced um, uh, from baseline um, in the patients who received um, oxybutynin 2.5 or five twice daily in comparison to placebo. Um, there was a substantial um, uh, uh, reduction in, um, in hot flashes. And what this shows us is hot flash related disease inventory scale, I think is what this is called, all sort of the things that can happen with um, uh, associated with hot flashes and endocrine therapy. And what you can see is that um, there's tremendous um, reduction um, in many of these side effects with, um, with um, oxybutynin. Some things to note uh, that did not improve with oxybutynin because its mechanism of action um, uh, uh, is not um, uh, it does not control for these things are things like concentration, um, mood, and sexuality because it doesn't have these kind of cognitive effects, so it did not impact those outcomes. So as we think about management of hot flashes, again, um, uh, that are predominantly caused because of endocrine blockade, 
Can you block less endocrine therapy? Is that appropriate? And it's not appropriate for some patients. Patients with metastatic breast cancer, not appropriate. Patients with high-risk breast cancer, not appropriate. But um, patients, especially with intraepithelial neoplasia, it looks like it's very appropriate. And I would say when patients with early stage breast cancer have so many difficulties that they're considering coming off of treatment, it may be a nice middle ground to rest upon. Um, so managing atrophic uh, vaginitis is a problem that 85% of patients with metastatic breast cancer may incur because of changes in their endocrine um, system as we um, block endocrine therapy with about 85% of patients with breast cancer, with metastatic breast cancer. Um, we know atrophic vaginitis is common. Um, it tends to be worse with aromatase inhibitors than it is with tamoxifen. Um, there are simple fixes, um, uh, things like vaginal lubricants, uh, like silk, astroglide, pink, and wet. Vaginal moisturizers that you can use more chronically, like replens. Vaginal estrogens, uh, like Vagifem, that actually has um, really negligible system, uh, systemic uptake, so can be used safely to treat symptoms. And then pelvic physical therapy. So for those of you that are chronically blocking endocrine therapy that have atrophic vaginitis, there is a spectrum of effects that can occur. Um, sometimes you have a decrease in the va vaginal musculature um, that it thins over time. You can have a, um, increased friability of the vaginal mucosa where um, it is more likely to rip and tear during penetration and intercourse. You might notice that you have frequent bleeding uh, during intercourse. And uh, the vaginal introitus, or the opening of the vagina, can shrink, um, uh, uh, making penetration uh, either impossible or uncomfortable. For every patient, there's a spectrum of how significantly this occurs. But if you're blocking endocrine therapy, which if you have metastatic breast cancer and are on this therapy for a long period of time, um, usually people have some side effects in this realm to some extent. And sometimes people have um, such vaginal atrophy and closure of the vaginal introitus that it makes penetration impossible and intercourse impossible. That can be a real challenge. And for most of us, our sexual health is an important part of our health. Um, and so having a healthy sexual relationship is critical in trying to think about how we um, come back to, um, come back to uh, um, uh, a healthy, um, healthy vaginal environment where you can have healthy intercourse is important. So some things that can be useful um, are pelvic physical therapy. So when patients have complete um, atrophy of the vagina and have closure of the introitus where penetration is not possible, um, patients can benefit from pelvic physical therapy um, uh, to try to improve their function. And that consists of many things, but um, largely um, patients can use um, increasing size dilators, um, uh, which can open the introitus gradually. In addition, um, local um, uh, treatment with, uh, with um, vaginal estrogens is something that can thicken that vaginal mucosa and also strengthen the, um, the lining um, of the vagina so it makes it less likely to tear. Um, in addition, once you have a thickened mucosa, once you have increased the introitus to the point where penetration is possible, and once that muscle is more thickened, um, having intercourse or masturbation are useful ways in which you can have um, uh, better um, vaginal health because um, you facilitate contraction uh, with the vagina with orgasm, um, and that is something that will help you continue to be more functional, functional sexually. Any questions about vaginal atrophy? Do you have like coconut oil or something more natural? Yeah, olive oil and coconut oil are natural um, lubricants that would be great to use. Certainly there's no, no problem in using them. A lot of people use them both as a, um, as a, a vaginal lubricant um, uh, just for daily use in addition to as needed with intercourse. And I think it differs you know, for every person based on how much lubrication is a challenge for them. Because it's surprising to me for some women that are chronically on endocrine blockade, it's never an issue. Um, uh, but you know, if, if it's a serious issue, using daily vaginal lubrication can be useful. And if it's sometimes an issue, using it as needed for intercourse can be helpful. Uh-huh. Um, hopefully that will be something that comes up in the future. 
Yeah. So what are, I'm assuming that this is probably something that I'm going to have to buy check with. So what are things, I mean, what do you do in case you get an issue because I'm not sure that this is going on? Well, um, so I'll say um, I, uh, you don't need a partner to sort of understand what your lubrication status is, right? So, um, so I, I would just, you know, see if you have a challenge with lubrication or not. That's something you should be able uh, to, to detect. Um, uh, if you're thinking about engaging in, in intercourse, you need to understand if you have a challenge with your vaginal introitus. And so, you know, understanding if penetration is possible is useful. And with regards to the, um, the vaginal lining in the mucosa, um, it, masturbation is something that you can do to try to make sure that you continue to have um, uh, natural lubrication and contracture of the vaginal musculature to make sure that it's um, contracting at, at regular intervals and sort of, you know, working, that all things are working. Any other questions about this? I think, um, you know, I always try to bring up sexual health uh, with patients and frequently it's with their partner in the room, um, which makes people a little uncomfortable in talking about it, but I feel like sexual health is a really important part of our lives. Um, and so I've also, in my experience, it's variable between clinicians who talks about sexual health and who doesn't. So I, I'm sorry? Yeah, so I would encourage you to ask questions. Know that this is a really important side effect for most patients who are breast cancer survivors um, that are undergoing treatment for um, metastatic breast cancer. How many here um, have estrogen positive disease? If I show of hands, so this is everybody that's almost that's gonna have an issue with this. Um, so I would encourage you to bring it up with them. And I would even suggest that if you come from somewhere or have an oncologist that doesn't feel comfortable discussing this with you, I've noticed among my own partners, um, sometimes some of our male colleagues that are 70 and older maybe don't even bring up. In fact, I remember having a conversation where one of my male colleagues said, why are you worried about sexual health? None of my breast cancer patients complained about sexual health issues. And I'm like, well, you never asked them, so it's probably, <laughs> it probably contributes to them not complaining. Um, uh, but um, if you're not getting this from your doctor, I'll say that that's common, that a lot of doctors won't discuss it with patients, either because there's other things that they're focused on or it makes them uncomfortable and they don't wanna ask. So you can ask about it, and there may be other resources aside from your um, aside from your um, uh, medical oncologist that can help address these issues. So um, we have in Austin now a new vulvodynia clinic for people that have chronic vaginal pain. That's been a great resource when I've had trouble uh, uh, troubleshooting patients. Um, uh, some gynecologists in certain areas are particularly skilled at these issues. And then the pelvic physical therapy group um, is really helpful at help troubleshooting this also. So even if your doctor's not awesome at addressing this, make sure you ask about other resources because referral to an OB-GYN or certain OB-GYNs and pelvic physical therapy can be useful. I'll tell you we have three providers of pelvic PT locally here um, that in my opinion all do a great job. Um, and I'll just say that it's so meaningful to have patients come in and tell you, Dr. Pat, I've had breast cancer and been on treatment for five years and have not had an orgasm, and I just was able to have intercourse with my partner and have an orgasm, and that's like they're in tears. It's wonderful. And so, um, so I'll say for most people, this is a part of their healthy life, and addressing these issues is important. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, so I have all of this. Yeah. Did you have your cervix removed with your history? You did. Okay. Um, uh, 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 so you're you're at risk for having greater symptoms. Actually, um, uh, I know. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. He couldn't answer that. He's like, well, it's case by case. Tell me what I'm doing. I would say it is a case by case basis. Um, uh, um, uh, so you should still have the ability to have orgasm and have a healthy functional sex life, um, but you are more likely to require um, intervention like pelvic physical therapy um, and possibly a little topical vaginal estrogen, which we think is safe. I know everyone's like, 
I don't know about giving the estrogen, but you know when they used, uh, and, and we don't believe that estrogen on the skin is okay because that's systemically absorbed, but Vagifem specifically when given vaginally, and what I tend to recommend is that patients take it for 14 days every day because that kind of thickens up the vaginal mucosa and immediately changes that skin um, uh, to be more pliable um, that after those 14 days, then they take it every two to three days as necessary. Um, and uh, then uh, you know it'll help improve symptoms. So I would make sure that you follow up with either your gynecologist or a gynecologist that feels comfortable addressing this issue if you're not getting that from your medical oncologist. Um, and I'll say that's common. Okay. Um, bone health is really important. Um, so again, for most patients um, with metastatic breast cancer, we try to um, block endocrine therapy or block endocrine um, uh, manipulation as much as possible. So in patients with metastatic breast cancer, I tend to recommend um, you know, that they suppress ovarian function, usually with <coughs> salpinga oophorectomy, usually by removing the ovaries, and then be treated like a postmenopausal patient, because that's very effective um, with either aromatase inhibitors or, um, or phaslidex or tamoxifen. Um, and when they do that, bone health can be compromised. So tamoxifen actually lays down some new bone, um, uh, but the rest of them can diminish your bone health, as estrogen is actually um, helps you lay down new bone and grow new bone over time. Bone health is actually really important in patients with breast cancer because when breast cancer metastasizes, it goes to the bones 80% of the time. And all of these agents will diminish bone health over time. So we need to be active participants in making sure our bone health is good because we know that in patients with metastatic breast cancer to the bone, that involvement of the bone um, and poor bone health leads to increased skeletal related events like fracture and pain and increased progression in the bone. And so knowing that that is more likely if you have poor bone health, we need to be aggressive. Um, so. Um, Strength training is something that you can do, right? Exercise, I hope, is a recurring theme that you're hearing over the course of the weekend, that strength training um, is really important. And I always tell people that there's not one magical answer with strength, uh, strength training. It's not um, that you have to go to a gym and be working with a, um, uh, with a, um, a um, physical, uh, trainer, thank you, um, to try to increase your bone strength. It can be something as simple as making sure you're doing squats and lunges at home. Um, I walk my dogs in the morning, so I try to get my lunges in in the morning when I walk my dogs. I'm sure my neighbors look at me like I'm a crazy person, but um, you know, you don't have to have a particular place that you go to to get strengthening done, but making sure that you're bearing weight on your, um, uh, on your heaviest bones that are producing cells is the best way that you can do that. So it can be with things like weightlifting, but it can also be with things like lunges and squats at home and, and even walking or jogging are good ways to improve your bone health. Okay. Yeah. So I just want to make sure I work out. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so that they attack electrodes to your main muscle group, and as you're working out, so you're doing, you know, strength training, you know, your squats, lunges, or your bench, and your uh, your main muscle group is basically contracting at about twice the rate it normally would, which is like one contraction in your squat. It's that continuing contraction. So it's about four times. Which was written yesterday, just so you know. Yeah. So I'll say no. I don't find any problem with the with the um, with the currents and the treatment. But it does bring up many important questions that we think about in terms of your overall health and wellness. So particularly with bone health, it probably doesn't matter because it's probably not doing because it's not increasing weight bearing. It's not doing things to increase the um, uh, the um, burden on the bones um, that is going to make them stronger over time, which is so important <coughs> in patients with metastatic breast cancer to the bone to have bone health. But it is important for other things because chronically being on endocrine therapy um, for years 
decades, God willing, um, uh, you find that you have um, a decrease in your metabolism over time, which is why so many patients with metastatic breast cancer and on chronic endocrine therapy for five and 10 years um, uh, notice that they have a decrease in their metabolism and weight gain. Um, and so what that may do and I would say, you know, it's a little uncertain because we're kind of data driven and I, I don't yet know, but if you're using your muscles more, it may give you the opportunity of having more muscular exercise, um, and thereby increasing your core strength, which can um, increase your metabolism over time. So when I think about exercise for breast cancer survivors and particularly important for metastatic breast cancer survivors, um, it, when you, um, uh, there's the cardio aspect to make sure you're getting your heart going and you're burning, but the strength training is critical because while the cardio burns calories and we all wanna do that, um, the strength training is actually increasing your muscle mass is what you can do to increase your metabolism. And when you're able to increase your metabolism effectively, you increase your, um, your, ra your rate of resting burn, you know, the, the degree to which you burn calories when you're not exercising. And so uh, both of those are really critical. So I advise patients to try to get three to five hours of exercise in um, and to have it a balance between cardio and strength. Uh, I'm sorry, three to five. Three to five a, day? Uh, a week, a week, I'm sorry. <laughs> the three to five a day would be great. No, three to five hours. Sorry. Uh, three to five hours of exercise per week, I think, is a really um, good goal to shoot for and have it to be some balance between strength training and um, cardio for that reason. So I don't know if the electrical stimulation is a way in which you can effectively build muscle. But if you are effectively building muscle, then it will raise your metabolism is so good for you. Yes. Right. Yeah. So there are so many beneficial effects of exercise and bone health is just one of them. But bone health is really critical. And so I, I, I think it you know, warrants its own discussion because all patients that block endocrine uh, estrogen for prolonged periods of time will have um, diminished bone health. And it's the natural consequence of aging that we're not laying new, down new bone after 20. And so, um, uh, so you know, everyone, as we get older, um, our bones lose density. So strength training is one of the important things you can do to help that. And that will decrease skeletal related events like fract pathologic fracture and um, uh, pain in addition to progression in the bone for patients with metastatic disease. Um, in addition to strength training, uh, things like bisphosphonates are really important. Um, so um, most patients that have bony disease will be on bisphosphonates. There are a few contraindications. If you have poor, bony, uh, poor dental health, um, then you can have um, uh, uh, challenges with osteonecrosis of the jaw, and we're a little reluctant to use bisphosphonates without the counsel of a dentist or um, an orthodontic surgeon. Um, and if you, um, if you have kidney dysfunction because uh, Zometa and Prolia are cleared through the kidneys, then we're a little bit um, uh, um, reluctant to, um, uh, to use those agents. But generally, most patients that have metastatic breast cancer to the bone, which is again 80% of patients with metastatic breast cancer, um, will benefit from bone health agents that they usually will receive once per month over a period of two years. After two years, we change our, um, inner, uh, our, our timing of giving them. We tend to go to three months. And the reason for that is actually not data-driven. We're a very data-driven uh, profession. But we know that zolindronic acid, bisphosphonates in general as a class, and rank ligand inhibitors work permanently. So they, uh, bisphosphonates irreversibly bind the bone. So it is uncertain what the incremental additional benefit is after two years. And so we've resolved that by trying to give those therapies every three months after the 24 month window is completed. Um, in addition to bisphosphonates and strength training, you gotta have enough vitamin D. Um, it is shocking to me, but um, I feel like 80% of patients that I test for their vitamin D levels are low. Even here in Austin, Texas, where it's sunny and the weather's beautiful most of the time. Um, and so uh, uh, while vitamin D deficiency is more common in the North than it is in the South, it's common everywhere. And almost every patient that I, that I test ends up being low in vitamin D. So I actually recommend that patients take vitamin D 4,000 units per day um, that can help with a lot of things, but particularly bone health and can again decrease the likelihood of skeletal related events, pain and fracture. 
Um, I recommend patients take 4,000 units a day. Um, some doctors recommend 2,000 units a day. Vitamin D is fat soluble, so unlike vitamin C, where if you took a bunch of it, you would urinate it out, vitamin D is fat soluble, so you can take it once a week, and it still stay, stays bioavailable for your bones, um, and so you can take that weekly without, um, without complication. Um, so managing weight. This is critical um, uh, for every patient that's a survivor of breast cancer, um, especially after chemotherapy. It's amazing, but everyone um, who is about to take chemotherapy thinks that they're gonna lose weight on chemotherapy, right? They envision that chemotherapy is gonna make them physically ill, that they're gonna be nauseated, this can be hard to eat, and that they're gonna lose weight. Um, an average patient gains five to 10 pounds during adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, uh, because we are actually really good now at controlling vomiting. Nausea still happens, uh, but we're really good at controlling vomiting. And uh, people manage that by taking um, uh, small, uh, frequent meals frequently that are not the typical healthy meals that you would usually eat. Like maybe it's not, you know, kale and salmon. Maybe you're eating mashed potatoes because that's what's comfortable. Um, uh, and while that's okay, weight gain is really common. Also, when we block um, uh, estrogen over a prolonged period of time, um, uh, it reduces your metabolism over time and will, um, will, can cause some weight gain. So I wish there was a magic here. I wish there was some magical pill that I could give people to lose weight. I would be taking it myself. Um, uh, but there's not. Um, it, you know, it comes down to uh, f really focusing on exercise, trying to get that balance between strength training and cardio, making sure you're burning enough calories and increasing your metabolism. Uh, trying to make sure um, that your caloric intake is reasonable. And for most patients, some people need kind of a kickstart, um, uh, you know, in reducing their caloric intake. Because in your 20s and in your 30s, you were able to consume 3,000, 4,000 calories a day and not gain weight. And now you're taking in 1,500 calories a day and you don't lose any weight. And that's really challenging. So how, um, how do you manage that over time? So sometimes we engage a nutritionist to help um, as patients sometimes need some assistance in getting a kickstart. But it is really important, and it's important for a number of reasons. One, um, uh, breast cancer patients, because we do such a good job of uh, treating breast cancer long term, especially with the CDK4-6 inhibitors, many patients with metastatic breast cancer are not dying of breast cancer. So it helps you with um, things like diabetes and hypertension um, and um, uh, stroke, it reducing your risk for all of those endpoints. But the other nasty little fact is that fat makes estrogen. Uh, and that if you don't have a lean body mass, your body is producing more estrogen. So um, there was a study presented at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium this year that looked at efficacy of aromatase inhibitors like the letrozole, the aromadex, the aromasin in patients based on body mass index. And as it turns out, aromatase inhibitors are less effective when you have a higher body mass index because we give the same dose, whether or not you weigh 80 pounds or you weigh 300 pounds. Um, and so you can imagine that the same dose maybe isn't perfect for everyone as the body body can produce varying levels of estrogen. And so if you are struggling with your weight, know that that will have direct impact on your breast cancer because it's possible that you're not um, blocking estrogen effectively. Um, in addition to that, I'll say that managing weight is critical, um, I think, in sort of the spectrum of stress control. Um, so I often talk to patients um, about how to manage the stress in your life as a spectrum of various things. Um, and on that spectrum are things like um, exercise and healthy diet and making sure you get adequate sleep. I do think those are the three most important. There's also sex and laughter with friends and meditation. And then on this side, is, are things like Xanax and scotch and Oreo cookies, right? And they're all, they're all really important mechanisms to manage stress, but in general, you're gonna be healthier if you stay on this side of the spectrum. Um, uh, but managing your weight and participating in regular exercise is something really important in stress control that helps you um, uh, have healthier behaviors in managing all the other things in your life. So it's sort of counterintuitive, right? Because you're like, well, I don't have time to do that. But you have to make time to take care of yourself in order for you to be um, uh, as healthy as you possibly can be managing breast cancer long term. What? 
Um, uh, I think that um, uh, I, I believe in all things in moderation. So when we, you look at alcohol, there have been so many epidemiologic studies done on alcohol and breast cancer. And um, it, it's clear that high alcohol consumption um, leads to worse outcomes. Um, uh, but um, there was a large study that was presented a few years ago at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium that said four drinks or less per week is kind of the sweet spot. And so that's my counsel to people is that while there's a lot of uncertainty, um, on average, if patients can consume four drinks or less per week, that that's probably a moderate amount of alcohol use that, they that can be consumed safely for an average patient with metastatic breast cancer. There are some exceptions, right? So patients that have um, uh, predominantly liver disease, where the cancer has gone into the liver and they have multiple sites of liver involvement, they may even have compromised liver function. Alcohol consumption is more dangerous for that patient because for that patient, um, the you know they may have 20% of their liver to work with or 5% of their liver to work with as opposed to um, you know a normal liver function. But I think a moderate, moderate alcohol consumption. And it's interesting to me, of all the recommendations that you get from, uh, from oncologists, I would say that there's the most variability around alcohol consumption. But I, I just don't think there's any evidence to suggest that people have to abstain from alcohol. I think that um, moderate consumption of alcohol is reasonable. So I tell people not to exceed two drinks per day and not to exceed, or, or to, and to try to keep it to below four drinks per week. But is seven drinks per week a lot different than four? It's probably not. Um, uh, eight drinks and more was the highest risk cohort among that epidemiologic study that was presented. Um, so I would say moderation, but to aim for four or less. Not between oral therapy. So for patients that are on chronic endocrine therapy, there's not any interaction that's worrisome. Um, but for patients that are on chemotherapy, much of chemotherapy is metabolized by the liver. So paclitaxel uh, or taxol, nab paclitaxel or abraxane, uh, gemcitabine or gemzar, navalbine uh, or venerelbine. Um, uh, adriamycin or doxorubicin, um, uh, cytoxan or cyclophosphamide, those are all chemotherapy agents that are uh, metabolized by the liver. And so when, those, um, uh, when a patient is on those therapies, mm -hmm. their liver function can worsen um, if they consume alcohol and during therapy. So that's a different, um, sort of a different group. Also, there can be other things that you take that can make that worse off, like Tylenol, if your Tylenol consumption is high then that can make, um, make it harder to um, uh, manage your liver metabolism. And then sometimes, uh, as people um, take supplements, some mushrooms that people can take um, can increase your liver function test. So be careful if, you are, um, if you're taking any kind of supplements to discuss those with your doctor. I'd had a patient last year that I was trying to qualify for a clinical trial who had metastatic breast cancer to her liver and her liver functions disqualified her and she was on a mushroom supplement and I've seen that now many times. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I don't know. Well, I think it's challenging because, you know, the Food and Drug Administration uh, uses data to approve drugs and nutraceuticals or nutritional supplements are not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, which means that there may not be as much evidence to support their use and that the dose per um, uh, item that you're getting, be it a pill or whatever, can be variable because it's not regulated by the FDA. And so uh, it's not to say that those are bad inherently, but you should discuss what you're taking with your physician. Um, in my office, we have we use our pharmacists to query a database called Natural Standards, where they can look for any poten uh, potential interactions with some um, complementary therapies that people take just to make sure that there's no inherent um, conflicts to answer those questions. But they're complicated and there are just not as much data. So you'll have some doctors say, don't take any of that. And I'll say, I think that's pretty limiting, but I would say at least bring that up with your physician so you can make sure that um, you know what they have or they know what you have. Um, cognitive and mood side effects. <laughs> Um, so uh, cognitive and mood side effects related to chronic endocrine therapy can be variable. Um, uh, most patients actually don't have cognitive and mood side effects, but I have had patients on endocrine therapy 
that um, do report um, depression and anxiety. I would say that's more common. And then that report real cognitive dysfunction. So people that um, have um, uh, very um, mentally dependent jobs, that they are not able to have the executive function that they had prior to being on endocrine therapy. So if you depend on an endocrine therapy strategy because you have metastatic breast cancer, um, uh, this can be really challenging and you have to think about how to troubleshoot that. Um, the counsel that I can give you with regards to mood is that frequently involving a therapist is really useful, like a counselor and a psychiatrist. Um, we tend to start um, uh, uh, antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications as a first step, but if this is a strategy that you're on for years, right, which is likely, um, and this is the major limitation in your quality of life, engaging other people on that team to help is gonna be really critical. Because I've got like a few pivots that I can use with antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications, and then I'm kind of out of moves, just because it's not within my repertoire of expertise. And so I frequently engage other healthcare um, individuals like psychiatrists and counselors to work on cognitive behavioral therapy to help and to work on um, um, uh, other pharmaceutical interventions that may help because um, for a particular individual, um, discontinuing endocrine therapy is probably not a reasonable option. Um, we do see, though, that um, uh, some side effects can vary between classes, like if you're on a selective estrogen receptor modulator, maybe switching to an aromatase inhibitor is a reasonable pivot. But these kinds of side effects, like cognitive impairment and mood disturbance, actually are just an estrogen effect. And so it's more likely that they're going to be the same between the Fazlodexes and the Tamoxifens and the Femaras and the um, Aremidexes of the world um, because they, it's, it's an estrogen effect. Um, there are a lot of things there there are a lot of things that people do um, that uh, that you can recommend to help with the cognitive function and executive function people talk about relearning new paths um, uh, of cognitive function and that that's really important to um, uh, to uh, getting your higher level um, higher level um, executive function but that it can't be the same things that you used to do so doing new forcing yourself kind of like exercising your brain um, to do new cognitive loops. Um, like I know luminosity is a program that has gotten a lot of um, uh, that has gotten a lot of press um, that a lot of people are interested in because it ha kind of has these mind puzzles and makes you think about things differently. I've had um, other patients take on the crossword uh, the New York Times crossword puzzle um, on Sundays um, uh, and other various things. But to it is important, I'll say, to explore new paths of cognitive development. Um, uh, as opposed to trying to redirect old paths. So um, continuing to explore and exercise your mind is critical. Um, we don't have a lot of science behind uh, the things that impact cognitive dysfunction. And so I'll say that um, that, that work continues to be ongoing. And so until the time when we have a better pill, um, I would recommend that you, um, that you take on new paths and new things. Um, when patients have metastatic breast cancer to the brain, and undergo radiation therapy. We are using now Nemenda or some uh, drugs that treat Alzheimer's disease is in the radiation literature. That's uh, been proven to be preventative. Um, you know, patients who receive radiation therapy to the brain as a whole um, can have cognitive impairment that can occur years later, and that's one of the things we believe that can diminish that cognitive impairment. So in some certain populations where you have certain treatments to the brain, that's something that can be effective. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that I, one, I wouldn't recommend neuropsych testing for everyone from the get go. 
It costs several thousand dollars, it's generally not covered by insurance. Um, and I would say there's not really anything you're gonna do about it. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, I would say that um, uh, I think that cognitive dysfunction is complex. It's not simply an estrogen factor. I think that for a lot of people, cognitive impairment is uh, a combination of estrogen blockade and the tremendous stress of coping with your breast cancer diagnosis. You know, how is this going to impact my family financially? How is this going to impact my children? How is this going to impact my spouse? What do I need to plan for? And so I'll say that um, I think that it's a large contributor um, uh, to what happens with endocrine therapy, um, managing this stress. And so. Um, in addition to having new paths of cognitive development, um, compensating behaviors, maybe it's setting an alarm, maybe it's making lists, you know, various things. Um, I would say that there's great utility in trying to manage that stress effectively um, because uh, to what degree that's contributing to the larger part of cognitive dysfunction, that can be mitigated. And so, um, so I would focus on that aspect because I think it's correctable and a focus, a challenge for all patients with metastatic disease as you think about how it can impact various aspects of your life. And do you see cognitive executive function kind of being, like right now I'm in an active chemo, and prior to getting diagnosed with metastatic, I was doing the tamoxifen and was on that, and it was better than when I was on my first round of the chemo. Yeah. Yeah. I am on a shot to stop all estrogen produ production right now, but would I expect that maybe it would improve some when I'm on the active chemo as far as IV chemo? Or yes, because I think that's a stress in your life. So, sure, I think that it's likely to improve some when you're off active chemo. Um, that certainly contributes. It, just for me personally, that's a really annoying side effect. Yeah. Right. 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 I will tell you, I've been doing this 15 years, and I've had conversations with my doctor that I feel like I'm getting dumb. And he's like, You're not dumb. I said, I swear I'm getting stupider each day. Chemo threw me up way more than any oral medication. And I did hold my own initially. And that was absolutely the worst time because I literally was like, What's that called? I, I know that. And I just, so each one's got. I found about six months after we switched to something that kind of you kind of see them in one. Um, sometimes it's good for if I was supposed to go back like six months ago, so I can't find it out. This is my new normal. This is what's going on. I've been telling this real. These are my side effects. This is how that's kind of the sweet spot for me. I can't keep them in my mouth. So each one of those is like a thing. I mean, there are times when I'm like, I cannot remember the name of that. That is a cup. I've seen it for you know 40 years. Why can't I remember it? Right? Yeah. So and I think it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I know we just have um, uh, a little bit of time left, and so um, I did want to talk a little bit about managing stress. So I already talked to you about my spectrum of, of things I think are important, and, and I'll say this is different for everyone, um, as what helps you is not going to be the same as what helps the person next to you. It's also different culturally um, and based on your resources, but in my mind, um, uh, this can be things like exercise, things like laughter, things like good nutrition and adequate sleep, and those are the most important for everybody. 
you're not sleeping, you're going to be in a terrible place. Like, so that's the thing that has to happen first. You have to sleep at night in order to be positioned to help yourself. Yeah. Um, but those are the most important. And then, the, you know, things like, um, you know, closeness with a friend, laughter, sex, um, uh, 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 Oreo, Scotch, Xanax, you know, all are on the spectrum. But specifically unique to, um, uh, to the metastatic population, I'll say, I think um, uh, transparent communication can be really helpful. And I'll say that this is something that's culturally variable, as um, among some cultures, people don't talk about the problems that exist. Um, uh, I'll say in my culture, uh, and, and with me personally, I'm very direct. For those of you that know me well, maybe too direct sometimes. Um, but I think actually having some of the hard conversations uh, are really useful. Um, so um, uh, talking about things like advanced care planning, talking about things like um, your values that you want your practitioner and your team to respect as you undergo your journey of cancer are important. Having things like an advanced directive to physicians and a medical power of attorney and not because, oh, you have a metastatic cancer, and so we got to do that, you know, right now because this is, you know, the end of your life, because that's not the case. We believe that met patients with metastatic breast cancer in today's world are going to go on and live for, I mean, while it's variable for different kinds of breast cancer, that you have a great prognosis. And so, um, so it's not because um, of some imminent doom that we perceive, but more so that if there's hard work to be done, if we can get it done and set it to the side, we don't have to focus on that anymore. And that's not something that chronically has to plague your mind. Have I talked to my spouse about if financially we're going to be okay if things change for me? You know, have I talked to my loved ones about um, uh, the desires I have for my children um, if things are to change? Like that's some emotional heavy lifting. And I feel like once you sort of get that done and can put it to the side, it no longer has to wake you up when the hot flashes plague you at 2 a.m. And it can let you go back to sleep faster um, and is a really important um, uh, emotional heavy lifting of managing the stress of having cancer as a chronic illness. Um, those are the big things that I wanted to talk about today. Um, uh, so please, if you all have specific questions, I'm happy to answer them. On the one slide, you put a debt for bone health, a deficit every other year? D making sure that your bone health is being monitored, yes. I just I haven't heard of that. Debt. It's a bone mineral density study. So it's dual emission scintography, um, but it's a bone mineral density study. And that's just what your regular bone scan is. So it's different, actually, than a bone scan. So you could, it's a bone density scan. So it's an important distinction because people often mistake this and the wrong test is ordered. But um, a bone scan is something that you do to detect if there is cancer in the bone. A bone density scan is a test that you do to detect the density of your bones to determine if therapeutic intervention is warranted because you're at high risk of fracture. And so, um, so it's important that you're monitoring your bone health and that you intervene as necessary. Now, for some patients with metastatic breast cancer, it may be a moot point because if, you've, if you have breast cancer all throughout your bones and are getting a lot of bisphosphonate intervention anyway, then it may not be something that you need. But for the patients that don't have metastatic breast cancer to their bones specifically, then having better bone health will diminish the likelihood that they develop metastatic breast cancer to the bone. So it becomes really critical. So I, I would talk to your doctor about being on bisphosphonates, and here's why. Um, in the last two years, we now recommend bisphosphonates for all postmenopausal patients with breast cancer because 
um, uh, it decreases the likelihood that they develop breast cancer in the bones and breast cancer related death at five years. It improves it by like 5%, it's really amazing. And so we believe it can actually be prevented and kind of like the seed and soil hypothesis if the soil being the bone is not fruitful for the seed being the cancer to germinate, then it's less likely for that to develop. So I would say that if you're not currently on a bone health agent, you should talk to your doctor about starting one because you have two medical indications to start treatment. One, your breast cancer, and two, your osteopenia. And you starting treatment will diminish the likelihood that you develop breast cancer in your bones. Which would be great. Which would be great. <laughs> yes. Conta keep the tiger in a cage. Absolutely. So there, there are a couple of different ones, but Zometa is a common one, um, uh, which is a, um, a bisphosphonate. And then uh, I'm on it. Prolia. I'm 15 years, and I am, I am not supposed to start, but I am one of the few people in my doctor's practice that's on my own. And there's seven other places, but it's not a <laughs> Yeah, you don't um, rehabilitate a bird. Yeah, that is my safety risk. And so, um, and then the other drug that people use sometimes is called Prolia or um, denosumab, which is a rank ligand inhibitor. It works really similarly. <laughs> but those are both bone health agents, and it sounds like you have two indications for them. Now, there may be a reason why your doctor hasn't started them, like a dental reason or a kidney reason. Um, but I would just have that discussion with your doctor because it sounds really reasonable. Yeah, and that's what just happened. Like, I wanted to get like right into the and I would say, um, just as the spectrum goes, I don't think so much of people supplementing with calcium. Like, I think it doesn't help you so much. You get a lot of calcium from your diet. And people generally aren't calcium deficient. You are deficient in vitamin D. I mean, I, I don't know you specifically, but no, as a whole. Yeah, so I would make sure you're supplementing with vitamin D, and then I would talk about bone health agents with your doctor. Did you have a question? Um, so uh, I would say that also talk to your doctor about that because what we worry about when people have a vertebral metastasis in the bones that um, are near the spine and you get epidural extension into the spine, um, if people have pain, it's usually because that epidural extension can be pressing against the spine. And over time, that can cause problems with that cord compressing that could lead to um, bowel and bladder incontinence and um, paralysis. Well, the incontinence also is, you know, I'm taking opioids to try to manage pain, and that stops that too. So, um, so I'll say there is spot welding, I'll call it. The radiation therapist would kill me for saying that, but spot welding yeah. of local pain issues with focal radiation therapy. They can even do it in one treatment can be amazing at relieving some focal, some focal pain related to bony metastasis, and especially if it may be causing a little spinal cord compression. But I'll say specifically if you're having pain because of some spinal cord compression, your doctor needs to know about that because it becomes an urgent issue that we gotta, we gotta spot weld that spot real good. Because you know there's so many things in cancer that are reversible, but if you lose the function of your extremities because you have a spinal cord compression, it will not come back. And so, um, uh, so that becomes an urgent issue in our mind. Yeah, and I, I'm dealing with fibromyalgia when I get home. Okay. It is, but, you know, it's up one way or another, and it's just frustrating. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and then let me just add, say one more thing is that sometimes engaging a palliative care medicine uh, uh, doctor is really useful at troubleshooting pain issues that simple opioids and radiation therapy can't help or doesn't help optimally. Don't live with chronic pain. See someone to help. So actually, as our practice, it's challenging as an oncology practice to bring on palliative care doctors, but we actually have brought on one. We're about to bring on another just for this reason, because we have so many patients that are living such a long time with cancer, and if you have pain all the time, your quality of life is going to be bad. And so, um, so you need 
need to be able to manage that. And so, you know, Dr. Dang is the, who I refer patients to now who's in our practice. And he's been so helpful in patients managing chronic pain. And so I would suggest that you see a palliative care specialist. I think patients with metastatic disease are kind of a little reluctant to do that because you're like, well, are you sending me to hospice? Is that what I'm sending to palliative care? But, you know, palliative care is really just the best supportive therapy that we can provide. And so that is a nice complement to um, your current medical therapy in the event that you're having uncontrolled symptoms. And they're incredible. And I'll tell you, I have had multiple patients in my practice that could not walk that are now walking rapidly multiple miles per day uh, because of good disease control and good pain control and it's really life-changing yes well I'll say um, uh, Yes, yes, CBD oil um, doesn't really have any restrictions. Um, I, I've not seen a lot of data to support its help, its helpfulness, but there are a lot of anecdotes that people have that, um, that say it's helpful. Um, so, I mean, I don't see any harm in doing it. Um, again, it's not the active component in marijuana, which in this state only has a medical indication for children with refractory status ap epilepticus. So this session, it's actually coming up again and again, so that may change. Uh, but, um, but CBD oil, which is a different beast, um, I would say we don't have a lot of data, but I, I think as a complementary therapy is something that could be helpful and certainly is not harmful to try. I love that for those that are interested in CBD oil. The chemistry is actually different in CBD, and you actually do need some THC, a small amount in there, to actually properly fully activate it. And I will tell you, as someone, probably not, I'm like taking this over now, but um, you using the opioids that are horrific, um, I don't use those anymore. I do a one-to-one -one CBD, THC, and lidocaine patches. And let me tell you, I have extensive bone mass and a lot of pain, and my quality of life is so much. Lidocaine patches are great. Lidocaine patches, I carry they're my body. Amazing. They're amazing. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, 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 yeah. So they're they're the lidocaine patches, yes. Okay. I will tell you, I was petrified. My doctor sent me to hospice. And I'm like, I'm not dying. He goes, no, 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 no. Trust me, they're amazing. And I walked in there and I'm shaking and I'm crying. They have been the best thing for me for support. All of the stuff they can do that my doctor can't do, it's not just for people that are dying. Yeah. We've got all these amazing, amazing things it, that they can do once you get over that fear of, this is where they send people to die. They it's a great point. Um, it's a great point, and uh, and I'll say it's true of palliative care and hospice that um, they're, they provide great supportive therapies. A challenge sometimes is that um, if you refer a patient to hospice for services, then they have a global pill billing period, kind of like surgery. And so uh, then all services that you receive have to come out of that same global billing period. So they will usually not pay for chemotherapy. And so usually um, uh, the choice to take hospice or chemotherapy is mutual exclusive because of the payer global billing requirement and not because of some intellectual challenge in them being complementary to each other. My understanding is palliative the overall coverage that you're paying, but hospice, you have to have a six month termination. Um, well, so. Because they offer like, there are support yeah. groups, there are programs, there are stuff like that, but you don't have to necessarily be under hospice care by name to right. go. Great. Thanks, y'all, for your time this morning. Thank you.